Hello, hello, Huda. So good to have you in my podcast, Longer Tables. I am honored. I've uh, First of all, you know I've admired you for a long, long time. And last night I decided what a good moment to re-rack 60 Minutes and watch my friend Jose in the spotlight again. <laughs> Jose, I have to tell you, you're, you're, you're one of a kind, you're one in a million, and I'm honored to be sitting across your long table. <laughs> oh, my God. I feel so embarrassed. I bring people here, friends like you here, uh, because we want to know about uh, about you, so thank you for the nice words. But uh, the long story short is uh, is not what I do. Is what I do that I get the credit for way too much is on the shoulders of thousands of people mm. that they are the ones making it happen. Mm. So thank you. But let's let's thank all those other people, not only with with the organization I founded, but. Uh, everywhere right mm -hmm. now uh, obviously ukraine is very close to my heart mm -hmm. right now and right now every single morning is people just trying to to save people's life bringing them water and food because a dam was destroyed and tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people lost their homes because you somebody had the crazy idea that bombing a dam was a good idea mm -hmm. so anyway for those people that they are trying to Work hard to save others or to bring the best in others. Yes, I'm racing what I'm drinking this morning because I'm, I'm, I'm having a glass of sherry. And I'm saying in the morning because Huda has been so nice to after her show and all the amazing things she does. She's right here with me on the podcast Longer Tables. Well, I'm honored. I'm gonna, you, you left me a glass uh, of your sherry too. Do you see that? Hey, hey, I'm having sherry, manzanilla, which, you know, my wife is from Cadiz, and this is from the south of Spain, mm. Cadiz, from a little town called o San Lucas de Barrameda or Puerto de Santa Maria. I know, it's too many stories, but I love sherry. Uh, sherry, I don't know, it's, I think it's one of those mm. drinks that needs more love. Mm. that people don't give enough love even in Spain. Mm. And that's why every time I can, I bring sherry. And you know what I'm having with the sherry? What? Yeah. What is that? Look at what I'm having. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, hold on. Don't brag, because somebody <laughs> left me some too. Iberico ham, also from the south. I mean, Iberico and sherry, I think they are the two best things. Oh, uh, okay. I'm going to try. Yeah, them. I eat it because I eat it. Uh, mm. 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 I have coffee too, though. Mm. Mm. Okay, that's great. Mm. I I love I I love that I was able to send this to you and you have mm. it right there mm. and it's like we are we are together longer tables. Huda. Mm -hmm. I mean longer tables from we are I don't know how many miles away from each other but a long table makes people like you and I mm. uh, be connecting. So I think th this is a question. You know, every time I've been with uh, with you or other hosts that work in the in the morning shows, uh, you know, um, it's 11.30 right now, 11.35 for me, uh, but but as a morning host, mm -hmm. I mean, you've been doing this for years. I mean, how and when your day starts, what ha, ha, has to be, has to be, you have to be almost like going to church, has to be the same routine every day. I'm imagining, I don't know. What's going on in hey, your life? That's Hula? exactly right. Okay, so Jose, I set my alarm at 3 a.m. and I don't use my phone. I actually used an old fashioned alarm clock because I've learned that if I do have my phone as my alarm and I hit the button to turn it off, the first thing I look at is all of the alerts and all the stuff that happened overnight. So I did, made a conscious decision. I'm not gonna look at anything, nothing, until I finish my morning routine. So the alarm glows off, old school, hit it, shower, Three o'clock, I'm, I'm out of there, 3.15. And then until 4.15, I do things that are all about level setting my day. So I go through a thing in the morning where I try to ask myself, what do I need that day? This sounds weird, but I do a, I'll ask my body, what do you need? I need exercise. I need a manicure. Okay. I ask my intellect, what do you need up here? You know what? I need to have a really good conversation with a good friend. I feel like I ask my the emotional part of me, what do you need, man? What what part, what do you need? And then I ask, I talk to like the spiritual part of me, the biggest part of me, 
the part that's unhurt, the part that is, you know, glorious. And I say, what could enrich you? So after I finish those parts of me, I scribble in my journal. I write, I write down what I'm feeling, what I'm needing, what I learned yesterday, blah, blah, blah. And when I'm done with that, Jose, I meditate for about 20 minutes. I just sit. And when that part is over, I have like incredible clarity. So I do prayers and meditation. And then when that, when that part is over, I feel like I'm clear and I'm awake. So by four o'clock, 410, then and only then do I look at the phone to see what horrible thing happened overnight. Because if it gets in my brain early, imagine the very first moment you're at your most vulnerable in your whole day. And you all of a sudden you allow in this avalanche of yuckiness. So that's why I do not do that right away. I get set. And now that I've got my feet on the floor, I'm level. I did all my stuff. I feel good. Now, tell me the news of the day. Tell me what we're working on. And I go through all my notes for work and all that stuff. Amazing. So that means that your close family members, uh, your, your good friends mm -hmm. that you hope to see every day, they are in a way almost at times having to be living on, on your schedule. Um, let me tell you the more clear. I mean, it's not nightlife for you. <laughs> I guess During the week, life. no. No. Jose, Jose, first of all, I have two children. <laughs> one is six and one is four, okay? I adopted them. It was like uh, a great moment in my life, the best moment in my life, really. But what I realized, the best part about having little ones like that is Everybody goes night night at the same time. Okay, they are I, they are in the bath at six thirty. We are I'm reading them a story at seven seven fifteen seven thirty. They're out night night. Then I go into the shower. I take a shower. I look at what's happening th the next day. By eight fifteen or eight thirty, lights out for me, and so it it works. Now my friends know never call after eight because. Everybody in our house is asleep, but I, I, I'm a morning person anyway. I love a sunrise more than I love a sunset. I love the beginnings of things. I like the start. I feel like it's magical. And so I kind of lean that way anyway. <laughs> Fascinating. So I, I, I just was checking, obviously, details of your life. And one thing, obviously, you were born in Norman, Oklahoma, but you were raised in Morgantown, West Virginia. Huda, I love Morgantown. Tell me. It's, it's a beautiful city. That, that, that amazing huge lake in the middle of that town. I mean, University of Universities uh -huh. in Virginia. I mean, so many young students. Man, I wish I went to university and I will <laughs> go to a town like that. But uh, I, I am a member, an uh, honorary member of a golf club called Pinewood, which maybe is the best golf club in the history of mankind. They have no carts. You can only walk. That means if you no, cannot carry your bag, uh, cabbies. <laughs> and it's only two teas, the, the black teas, and, the, and I think it's the pink teas. <laughs> and I play from the pink, and I have no remorse because the black is way too far. Morgantown, the best golf club in the history, wow. with an amazing, tiny, beautiful restaurant. Morgantown, by the way, my parents went to Morgantown, West Virginia, from Oklahoma. So my parents were in at OU trying to get their advanced degrees. And meantime, lo and behold, they started having kids, and they were, so they were pushing me and my sister around while they were studying, while they were doing everything. And then they chose to move to Morgantown, where my dad started working at WVU at the university as a professor. And my mom worked there as well. She had a degree in library science, so she worked there. So but we fell in love with it as kids. There were like 53 kids on our block. We used to, we, all I, were, I have the best childhood memories ever in Morgantown, West Virginia. And we went to Suncrest Elementary School. And there was something about, I still remember the day my parents told us we were moving to, to the D.C. area, to Virginia. We sat on our front steps and sobbed. I mean, wild, <laughs> wonderful West Virginia. I knew all, we used to go to every Mountaineers game. Like that was 
the place that formed us. That was the place also where we were where everybody knew us. So my parents are from Egypt. Their name's funny. They spoke with, at that time, they, you know, they had accents. So West Virginia was the place where we didn't have to explain. You know what I mean? It was like, oh, everyone knew us. They're, they used to call me Hody. Oh, there's Hody Copy. There's her sister Haller, brother Adel. Like, we just fit. And often for immigrants, you know, there's a, there's a kind of warming up period. Not for us there. We just, that was home. And so when we were getting ready to move, I was like, wait, what? This is like, this is the only place we know. But I fell madly in love. I cried when we left. Every time a a friend from the plaza shows up from Morgantown, we sing the fight song. It's West Virginia. It's West Virginia. The pride of every mountaineer. I mean, we know the whole thing. And I have to do it because that's love. So people of America... If you are near West Virginia, Morgantown, and you want to experience what Huda experiences growing up, teenager, uh, go there, and believe me, it's a good place. It's a fun place. It's a family place. It's a summer place. I ate great pizza in Morgantown. I forgot the name of the places. (laughs) And has great golf. What, What else can I say? There's nothing. So... So uh, the word on the street, I mean, uh, Egyptian, uh, the word on the street is that your mom is an excellent cook and sends baklava randomly here and there to the Today Show in the morning for everybody. Let me tell you something. I have distinct memories, Jose, of my mom making that baklava so meticulously with the phyllo dough and then the layer of walnuts and the honey and the butter and the, and the layer upon layer. And... All my friends loved it. My mom loves nothing more than making that dessert. And so she sends it to 30 Rock, to me at 30 Rock. And I walk in and I, every time it arrives, I start down in the basement in the control room and I have a bunch of little plates and I hand out all the baklava. <laughs> then I FaceTime my mom at, you know, whatever it is, five in the morning. And everyone's like, Sammy, that baklava. Like, it's her signature. And the look on her face when someone is biting into a piece of her precious dessert is like, she has two two looks in her eye. One, when she sees her children and grandchildren, which is amazing. And the other is when she's watching her kids, grandkids, or somebody eating a piece of the food that she cooked. And that baklava represents everything to me and and then she always says the same thing but did they like it i go mom they love are you sure the last batch was better i go mom it was so good but it's it matters so much to her and i realize her language of love jose has always been food has always been food i love you here's some here's a sweet treat all right i repeat that everybody in logger tables now said tell me what you Tell me what you eat, and I will tell you who you are. Already here in five, ten minutes, I mean, we, we, we talking about you, we heard Oklahoma, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Morgantown, uh, West Virginia, uh, Egypt, uh, Baklava. Obviously, uh, you are who you are, and all of this began early on in your life. Uh, wh- what I want to know is uh, the beginning. You, you are a girl that you really, you really move uh, in, your, in your life. Tell me, tell me there, what was home? How many places were home that really made, in a way that you have, that you remember that made a mark in the person you are today, in the woman you are today? I mean, Morgantown was definitely a home for me because it was where I was formed, basically. The other place, interestingly, that I've always felt the most at home, maybe more than any other place on the planet, happened later in life while I was growing and working. But have you ever landed in a place and said to yourself, oh, my gosh, I don't know what it is about this place, but my heart can rest here. This place has that trait for me. And for me, that city was New Orleans. The minute I got off the plane, it was like a puzzle piece clicked and I was home. I the things I love about life are so they're they're in abundance there. I love people who hug. No matter where you are, someone's hugging you. I didn't know what was happening when I got there. I was like, oh, my God, this is home. The food and the way people react to the food, the the men who are chefs, who are the hottest rock stars in the entire city, I don't care who you are. If you're not a chef, you're not on the top of the heap. 
and I just loved the sweaty dancing on the streets and the music coming out of everywhere. But the, the food is what makes it. A guy who will spend hours stirring a pot of gumbo and saying, I, I need more paprika. I mean, it's the best. So I think that city for me, when I, when I think about what's home, what feels like home for me, it is that place um, above all the others. New Orleans. Mm-hmm. I love New Orleans. Mm-hmm. And... Your family being from Egypt, mm-hmm. did you spend time in Egypt too that you yes, remember? Yes, I did. When we were kids, we went back quite a bit every summer to go see grandma and grandpa. And every, every summer? Every summer. That was the drill. And let me tell you something. There's no place on earth where food is, not the, is the language of love like Egypt because no, no matter where you go, if you're full, like we ate somewhere and we went to another relative's house and we were full. And my mom goes, take it, eat it anyway. I go, but mom, I'm full. Eat it. You must eat it. Because what, what place in, what place in, in, in we were, the capital? We were in Cairo, in, in, Cairo? in Alexandria. That's where some of my relatives live. Port Said is another spot. So we used to go see all of our relatives and, and food was the language. In fact, many, many years later when I started working and we went to Egypt for a shoot, we were sitting outside uh, waiting on some steps of some building and out came this random woman from her home with tea on a, on a tray. And she goes, would you like some tea? And I was like, oh, thank you. So, and <laughs> my crew was like, do you know her? I go, I don't know. How do I know her? I don't know her. But because you were sitting there, it meant that you, and she hadn't seen us eating or drinking something in a little bit. They brought it to you as something to, Hell, I said, that's the way people are here. If you drop a bag of oranges, 10 people are going to get down on their knees to help you pick it up. It's the way it felt when I was a kid, and it's the way I, you know, I feel like that part of it shaped me too. And also to arrive in a country where, you know, and you know when you're an immigrant, you're, you know, your parents are immigrants, you fit in. But when you arrive in a country, and I, I didn't and don't sadly speak the language, but when I went back, I remember looking around and seeing eyes like mine everywhere. And it was so shocking. It was like, like all of a sudden, I was like everybody else. You yes. Yes. You be, you be That's right. Um, and it was, I just remember that feeling thinking, I don't know that I've ever had that feeling before. Yeah. I think we grew up uh, and I guess it's life that uh, the system, the ways, makes us kind of be almost worry about the people. They they are not like us, or they maybe they look like us, but they are from different parts of the world. And we have this kind of protection mm-hmm. system in our DNA. Uh, it's like you should be afraid of the world. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I love to do... Uh, you know, if I was president of any country, I will make it mandatory everybody to have a passport. I will send it in the day you born, and I will make sure that you have to fill up every page of the passport visiting countries around the world when you're young, because that's the moment that you realize that, yeah, you are who you are. You may look different or different accent or religion or whatever, but that when you see the world, actually the world is a much better place that sometimes you read on the news, on the web, or you see on TV. I totally agree. I 1,000% agree. And the world is also so much smaller when you travel. Like I still remember it. I heard someone say, in my lifetime, one time I want to go to Egypt and see the pyramids. And I said, well, what do you, do you, why don't you save the money for a ticket? I mean, because the person could afford it. One day, one day. Well, why one day? It's actually a, an eight-hour flight. And there's a there's a hotel that you can stay like you can you can you can make it real. But I think sometimes things seem so far away or scary or too big or whatever it is that you feel like I can't do that. But you're right. I think the the more you it's like you everything becomes intimate. All of a sudden the world is small. Oh, that's like us instead of the whole let me stiff arm you and keep you 10 feet away from me. Any, I don't want to put you on the spot, but any good Egyptian restaurant that you Lord. know in New York? Oh, in New York. Um, or anywhere in the States? Most of them are in Queens. Um, and usually uh, we just okay. take in, I mean, we usually just get like a whole bunch of delivery when my mom comes. I can't, I mean, off the top of my head, you're putting me on the spot. Yeah, you are like remember. me. It's, it's the place it's I the drive place or the place I, I walk. Ex- exactly. Remember, it's like the pizza welcome. place in Morgantown. We don't. 
So this is the task we all have to do, people uh, of longer tables, um, if you are in New York, but if you are in any part in the state, so any part in the world. That is not Egypt, for sure, because I guess every restaurant in Egypt is an Egyptian restaurant, even if it's a McDonald's. Why? Because it's in Egypt. Therefore, <laughs> it's a fast food Egyptian. We are going to go in honor of Huda to an oh, Egyptian like restaurant. It. And, and we're going to learn more about uh, uh, Egyptian cooking. And, and that's it. That's the task that all the longer tables citizens uh, have. So listen, yeah, you go restaurants, you go through life. I mean, you, you have to, to come to terms right now that for many viewers, millions, you, you are a role model now. I mean... Your story is an amazing story. Uh, when when you were a girl, do do you remember who were your role models, your family members, or a very famous distant person <laughs> you saw in a movie? You know, it's funny. I think, as any kid of immigrants knows, when you come here, your parents one thousand percent believe that you can do anything because anything really is possible. It's not about who you know. It's not about having the right connections because my parents made it having zero connections. So they know that it's possible. In other countries, you have to know this one or that one. And no matter what degree you have, you won't get X, Y, or Z. But in this country, you can. And I think my parents instilled that right away. And I watched, I mean, look, my mom got, had a law degree and a library science degree. My dad had his doctorate in engineering. My mom ran a marathon at age 60. My, you know, my, parent, my dad started his own company. Like all these things happened with two people who came here, you know, just as kids, as a couple of kids. And if that's possible, then everything's possible. So I think that, that taught me that you can do anything. So when... I was trying to go about my career and I was having a rough go of it. I knew that when I looked in my mom's eyes, she didn't have the doubt. Like, oh, maybe you shouldn't have. She was like, of course you can. Keep going. Of course. You'll get something. Oh, you're the best. She would always say that. And, you know, and I kind of weirdly believed that she was right. Um, and she, it was her. She was the one. Like, you only, and here's the truth of it. You only need one. You don't need everybody cheering you on. You just need one. So if you have one, whoever your one is, you can make it. But it's like the way that your brain can decide, you know, I always tell my kids, if you think you can or if you think you can't, you're right. So just think you can. I mean, that's really the way it's got to work. That's a Henry Ford quote, I think, or somebody. <laughs> oh, Winston Churchill. Every time it's a good, great quote that nobody yeah. knows who to give it to, you just give it to Winston Churchill. Yeah, be great like I think for... it was him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the message we have here from you is that not only for America, but for many countries around the world, uh, we, we, live, we live interesting times, if not difficult times. We see a lot of people massively moving, moving from country trying to go to the safety of another mm. country. Uh, this is happening uh, not only in the southern border in, in, in the United States uh, with Mexico, but in many parts around the world. Uh, the, the, the message you share in the story of your parents coming to America is that immigrants like your parents, we, we, we come here, we come to America, we come to another country to contribute, not to take things away from anybody else. Mm. And I think this is a message we need every American to believe, even when there are voices that will say, Imm immigrants, we come to take away. Uh, I think everybody needs to take a harder look because the only thing I see in America, the country of immigrants, is, is a country that immigrants keep giving. Yes, they receive a lot, and I'm very proud, says Spanish American, everything I got, everything I was given. But uh, in the process, I know is many immigrants every single day giving back uh, everything they got. Your parents are use one more amazing story of immigrants giving back. I mean, that, you're so. That, by the way, that was a beautiful sentiment, and you're right on the money. I just feel like often it's easy to demonize people and groups, 
without knowing them and the idea that, um, you know, to know that when my parents came here, like if they were up against all these odds, who knows what would have happened with them or with me? You know, who would who knows? You know, when we were welcomed. They actually did an article on my parents when they came to, you know, Oklahoma University. Oh, look, this Egyptian couple watching TV. Like it was like, woo, you know, like how cool it was. But in, in other words, they were embraced. And when you're embraced in life, you can do anything. You know, you can become anything. And if you're up against odds, against other things, it's just, it's so difficult to overcome. So I think, look, I think you're right. I mean, you and I are both living proof as we sit here. Like, look, when things are good, they're great, you know, and, but when you're given, like, as we say, if you get, if you, if you're given a lot, then you should give away a lot. And if you are given a little, you should give a little, but either way, we've all got to give back like you're doing. So, you know, uh, everybody knows that I believe in longer tables, not higher walls, longer tables that brings people together that you you respect everybody, even if they don't think like you, that you put an extra chair when somebody's just arriving uh, to that moment in a real table where you are sharing a meal or in the table of life. Um, but in the process, yes, and we see it today more and more. You're going to find a lot of people where it's not only you have a disagreement, but almost seems he's... Or you think like them, and then there is mm -hmm. war. <laughs> or you think like them, or you're, you're the enemy. And I believe it's not about that. I believe we can, have, we can have disagreements and learning from those that maybe they don't think like you. If you do it in, in the right way, you, you may be learning from them as hopefully they may be learning from you. I mean, you, you have to... Um, I'm only guessing you, 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 you are a, a, a person that touches a lot of people, that meets a lot of people, that interviews a lot of people. And I'm guessing with the people you agree with, that's the easy part. Yeah. But you look to me like almost the perfect ambassador, the perfect diplomat, that you are a strong woman with strong beliefs, but at the same time you will have this kind of right or, or left hand to, to, to engage in a conversation especially with those that you even may be disagreeing strongly. Uh, you, you, let me put it this way. I see you like, yes, the ultimate uh, ambassador of bringing people together. Mm. Uh, I see it when, with your smile when you are happy, but sometimes mm. your serious face on the serious question. But any, with all your experience you have, in, and I'm sure with all the people you found that you didn't agree with, any... Any personal experiences or any, uh, you know, uh, feedback you can give people like me about what do you think we need to be doing more think, of getting I, along? Yeah, I think sometimes, I think we all just want to be seen and heard. There's a, there's a greeting in South Africa, I think it is, and translated it is, I see you. That's how they say hello. I see you. I see you. And sometimes you want to be seen and heard and felt. Like, and I think to me, when someone feels like they've been heard, it's like you take the temperature down about 10 degrees. So I try to listen, like, and really understand because whatever words are coming out of this person who you disagree with, that comes from a long history of things that I don't even know anything about. You know, there's a lot before that that came. And I can't we can't deconstruct what, what brought this person to this moment of rage, but there are lots and lots of things that probably happened up until this moment, if they're upset or whatever it is. But I tried to deescalate by listening. And I think at the same time, you have to use your own voice because sometimes just nodding and listening and saying, Oh, okay, I understand that. And not saying what your thoughts are. You are really kind of condoning whatever that person is saying. I think it's fair to say, I hear you. And I see that, and I understand that that must really be painful for you. You know, here's, here's how I see it. This is my perspective. But I think there's a civil way to do it because I really do think we all just really want to be seen and, underst and heard. If you're yelling, no one's hearing. It's like what, what's happening with all this 
back and forth screaming and yelling. And again, I think it takes a big chunk of, of empathy to understand. We've all had people who disagree with us personally, politically, whatever. That's life. Does that mean you're not going to have any friends who think different than you politically? I have friends who are on both, uh, in both parties. Yeah. And sometimes we say, you know, what's better if we don't discuss politics, but we have a ton of history. Let's, you know, and we're going to have a ton ahead. Let's talk about all the fun things that we like to talk about. But I think it takes it takes a lot of patience and maturity. I think popping off is real easy. Anyone can do it. My kids do it every day, you know. You know, but you, when you get a little older, you go, okay, I'm not, that's not going to, that's a button of mine, but now I recognize it. And also, by the way, Jose, I think if anyone hits a button in you, that's something in you you need to work on. Whatever the button is, you know how sometimes someone says something, you're like, why did that person say that? You're like, wait, wait, what is it about? What, what, how did that touch me? What was that? Why did that bother me so deeply? What was the, you know, and let me figure that out because they're going to be doing their thing. You're not controlling what they're saying or doing. But sometimes there's people who we have real disagreements with or someone who just chafes you. You know, someone who says something that you think sounds arrogant. You're like, did you, can you believe that girl? She was so arrogant. It's like, okay, so what's wrong with you? What's wrong with, let me think about what's, why it bothers me. So I think sometimes introspection works. And I also just think sometimes giving someone some room to say what they want to say and say, okay, you had your thing. I love you. Now, can I have my thing? Okay. Now let me tell you my thing. And then that's it. There's a conversation and no one's grabbing each other's throats. Yeah. It's only one person, I think, right now in the world, especially in America, I will not give him any room, but everybody else, I will give them all the room of the world. Because with that, I want to say, I have a feeling sometimes, and I love lambs, uh, uh, and I don't mean on the plate, but I love lambs. When I'm in yeah. the mountains, yeah. the goats, the lambs, I, I, I love how they roam free, but, but yeah, they, they, they all go yeah. together. They move right or left or up and down. I think we all need to be more like shepherd dogs, mm. like like the, the the leaders that takes us in the right direction. And that doesn't mean it's about in this case, Republican or Democrat takes. Oh my God, at the end is can we come up with the right idea that solves mm, the problem? Yeah. Can we and can we make sure that all of us only we don't always vote blue or red because that's mm -hmm. what you do? Think about mm -hmm. what you do that. And anyway, we need more leaders that brings us together versus leaders. How, how many people have asked you to run apart. for office? How many? <laughs> Just tell me how many. With, with my English, I will be talking to people and I have people raising their hands saying, can you repeat what, what you just said? I mean, come on. One of the things I always loved to go to the Today Show was not used because it was great right. and was life and was the yeah. adrenaline of the live moment. But was a way for me to practice <laughs> English. Yeah, I mean it. I, I mean it. So, so obviously, on top of yes, hosting uh, a TV show watched by millions, one of the you know a show is being airing since 1952, and here we have who is one of the amazing hosts moving this show forward. What, what I wanna, you have the podcast, which I love the name. Me, I have longer tables. You. The name of your podcast, Making yes. a Space. That's so important. <sighs> Making a space, like longer tables for yes. everybody to have a voice, to belong. So I love it because you interview inspirational mm -hmm. teachers. Uh, so what's your favorite takeaway from, from the latest season? And, and any, any moment, anybody that you say, I oh, yeah. Everybody's great. Yeah. But, oh, well, yeah. um, Viola Davis to me is the epitome of, you know, going through like the worst in life and somehow emerging. I mean, this is the per this is a person who endured beatings and horrible abuse and just a terrible upbringing that you were wondering how anyone could drag themselves out of and still find a way to love her parents as a 50 something year old woman. And yet Viola did that. I mean, she, I think my favorite thing about the podcast is that it reminds us that people who have been on their knees rise up. Shania Twain, who's the country singer, was so poor that they couldn't afford uh, food for lunch. She would show up and tell her teachers every day she was full. 
that's what she told them because her parents were so dysfunctional. They didn't have money. And her parents told her, if you tell them you don't have food, then they're going to break up our family. Is that what you want? So Shania's parents died in a, in a, in a, car crash, but she ended up raising her siblings on her own. There are stories after stories of these people who seem to have these spit shiny lives when you realize what they've been through to get there. And I think that's what turns me on. It's like our great, the greatest people on the planet have been through a hell that you couldn't even imagine. I mean, Rosie Perez was in some uh, in a home for juveniles with problems when she was three years old, like and she was literally just taken there and was it went through all of this hell while she was in there. And this this woman comes out and is now making incredible movies and doing incredible work. And I think the common thread with all of them is they all have just like this belief that they and they, they've been made tough through life. No one was pampered or taken care of. They had to grind their way out and they did it. So my podcast is sort of, it's kind of, it pulls down the curtain. Like, you know, everyone thinks, oh, that life was so easy. Well, was it? You you only came in on the last Hmm. chapter. The first, you know, the first 10 were were real rough, but this is where they wound up today. And so um, I I feel like that does it. But to your your podcast, you're not going to believe this. So there's this song. This is so weird. I'm just going to play it, and I hope we don't get in trouble, but who cares? Okay, so Adina Menzel was on our show once, and she sang this song, and it was, it's called, hang on, listen, it's called At This Table. Okay, just listen for a second. Hang on. It's, it's made for your podcast. Here we go. forgiven. There's enough for everyone. Okay. Last, this is just the chorus real quick. So Here it is. Okay. Remember the door is always open. Okay. Adina Menzel, please have her on and let her sing that song. Oh, well, look, I'm alone. I hope she will say yes. I, I'm going to use your oh name. Oh, my God. Please. The, this reminds me. It's, it's so beautiful. Oh, my God. I found the soundtrack <laughs> of my life. Uh, I have many soundtracks. Life is like, for me, a soundtrack. Um, but this reminds me of, uh, 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 and I wish my brain was <laughs> smart uh, like yours, and I remember, but is this, uh, I know some people are going to tell me, oh, that's a song. No, but. It's called Didi Wadidi, which is this amazing short yeah. story that uh, was uh, found in the Library of the Congress uh, um, uh, that was uh, written by different people, many of them Latinos and Afro Americans, that do the, during uh, the War Progress Administration, um, that then became the War Project. Uh, 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 they send um, um, uh, many Latinos, many Afro Americans across America because they couldn't get help under the WPA, uh, uh, and they send them for looking for what America was eating, like food projects, anything. So they will find books, recipes, stories. This Didi Wadidi was a short story that seems was passed mouth to mouth by uh, uh, Afro American slaves. And Didi Wadidi was this secret place that nobody could find. But if you found it, you will be free and will be this amazing table full of turkeys and chickens and oh, food that will wow. never end. And this is, 
Didi Wadidi, a magical place where everybody oh. could dream oh. of being free. And in Dream. a way, this is yeah, what this is ringing. Yeah. Didi Wadidi, I'm going yeah. to yeah. find the essay yeah, and I'm going to put know. it on, on the longer tables, but I'm going to personally send it to you. So we spoke about making a space. People, I know you have a lot of podcasts, but if you're looking for a new one, obviously I don't need to be telling uh, because she has millions and millions of followers and people know her. But yes, if you are listening to Longer Tables, is no way you are not listening to Making a Space. <laughs> and then moving yes. to the Today Show. Besides me, obviously, which I'm the most fun <laughs> culinary guest the Today Show ever uh, had, ever. Uh, with permission to everybody else, ever. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm the uh, I'm the only one that they have to put to every one of the hosts a translator <laughs> on the on the ear so they can follow my uh -huh. conversation. Uh, you were mentioning about the story uh, about not, not having food, not only of hers, but uh, I only want to uh, 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 connect that not having food because it's mm -hmm. a story of many. When people say it's not the business of the government to be feeding mm -hmm. Americans. And I will say, okay, I get it. You are the type of person that seems we should not have government and everybody needs to uh, take care of themselves. But it specifically seems food is something right now, politically, socially, that is some people that believe the government should be there when some people fall behind and the government should be there helping those people with a push in the back, almost mm -hmm. like win behind the cells. So people can, can sell to a better place. That's what government should be here for. Has nothing to do with socialism or communism. That's what government should be here for. That's what the democracy should be here for. But for the people that say, maybe the government shouldn't be feeding children in the schools. Uh, maybe government shouldn't be there helping those families falling behind because they lost their jobs or whatever happened to them. I will say that in a way, okay, just follow me. When we have a fire in our house, do we go on our own and we start putting water to try to stop the fire? We have the amazing brave men and women of the different fire departments. When we need to provide safety, then we have police. Even I know also it's a lot of controversy with police, but we have great men and women in the police departments given safety. When we fall ill, we need an operation and they need to take care of a loved one, Republican or Democrat. Then we have hospitals supported by governments that take care of you. So if we have all these different things in our society that help us, as the people that we have, why we should then have a government that also is there, like firefighters and like hospitals and nurses and doctors? Why we shouldn't be having there people that feed people when they fall behind and they are hungry and in need? Food yeah. for thought. I mean, I think it's... I think the idea that, that there would be a, a child who's hungry is just, that makes my stomach turn. The idea that there is a child who doesn't get a meal. I mean, think about your kids. Think about your kids want nothing, want a snack. I mean, think about the basics. I mean, there are, when, when children are in need, when children are in need, there should be nothing that stops any kind of, any, any need that they have should be met. We just did a story today. This is so crazy. But there were these kids who were lost in the Colombian jungle for 40 days. A 13-year-old girl and two, and, and her three younger siblings. The youngest one was one year old. Those children survived in that jungle for 40 days. Just, they just, they survived somehow knowing what to eat, what to drink, because they were of the indigenous, they were indigenous people. But I was just thinking about the resilience of children and what kids have to go through and what that what those poor children had to endure during that time. And when you think about the extremes of people in desperate need, I mean, the fact that when you when you have a, a rich country like ours, there should not be a child who's hungry, period. That's it. Period. Period. And and end of statement like that's it. Eighty nine percent of Americans believe that every American child yeah. should be fed. And who are the other if 11 you talk percent? to me, uh, the 11, they didn't know okay. they okay. did this yeah. question. 100%. So I would yeah. say it's 100%. Um, all right. 
of all the people you interview yes. in your entire life. And I would love to know the thousands of tens of thousands, of hundreds of thousands. If right now I can give you who, who you will interview mm. that you haven't um, alive or even, yeah, or even already passed away yes. to a better life. I mean, there's so many people who, uh, I mean, I don't yeah, know how to tough, you know, put me on the spot. the spot. I mean, I'm not sure. There's a ton of yeah. world leaders, MLK, Anwar Sadat. I would love to interview a lot of people from, from uh, just from history. I think that would be really cool. But I got to tell you, Jose, one of the things I like when it comes to interviewing is anybody, anybody who tells the truth, anybody if you're not selling something, if you're not trying to promote something, if you're just telling the truth, I feel like I can feel it in one second. Like you have a connection. And that's really it because I think the best interviews come from that. They come from an instant connection and not really about – sometimes it's about you know why they're there. But quite frankly, if someone's honest, that's the interview you want. Who? Do you know who I would love? Not to interview because, yeah, I don't think. I do a podcast and it's more about food more than. But I would love to share a table and just learn from. Um, I, I, I learned, quite frankly, I heard the name before when all the controversy about her photo on the, on the 10 or $20 bill. But then I watched the movie and I learned finally about her. Mm, Harriet That Tillman. would be amazing. I mean... I mean, I think I watched that movie already three <laughs> times, and I've been trying to learn more. Uh, if somebody will love to invite to my table, mm. that will be that will be at uh, and Clara oh. Barton together. Yeah, I love Clara. But what Clara Barton did too. That's great. But those That's a good two. Table. Yeah, sometimes it's fascinating. So, listen, uh, Huda, thank you for for finding time to spending time with us to listen to your words, mm. your stories, uh, the person, few of the <laughs> many stories that made you the person who you are and why oh. so many million love you and so many million <laughs> just wake up early, not as early as you, but early enough to see your smile and, and to listen to you, how you bring us uh, oh. the stories of America and the stories of the world. Uh, through your voice, it always sounds oh. uh, much better. Even when sometimes <laughs> the world is in a so-so place, oh. people like you bring us hope. Thank you Jose, for being there. Jose, thank for you. Us. I loved our conversation. It's so good to see you, and I'll see you soon.